On July 20th, 1993, a guy by the name of Donald Wyman was out clearing land in Pennsylvania. He worked for a logging company, and his job was to go in and, and cut down some of the logs before the crews came in to then haul them out. He was working by himself on this day, and the process of cutting down a tree, the tree that he was cutting down came down, landed on his leg, and broke his leg. In fact, crushed his leg. And he was so far in there that after calling out and yelling and screaming for an hour, no one came, and he realized that if he's going to save his life, he's going to have to get out from underneath that tree. The only thing that he could do in his mind was to cut off his leg. And so he took out a small pocket knife that he had in his pocket. And for the next hour to an hour and a half, he began sawing through his leg and then through the bone until he freed himself from underneath that tree. He then crawled to a bulldozer, drove the bulldozer out to his truck, got into his truck and drove his truck one and a half miles to a farmhouse where there was a farmer there who called 911 and then the crews came and got Donald Wyman and took him to the hospital and his life was saved. Donald Wyman took drastic action to save his life. He did something that is unimaginable. Something that you and I, I mean, we couldn't even think about possibly doing something like that unless, of course, we were in that situation and that was the only way by which our life could be saved. Today we're going to be looking at drastic action, decisive action, action that needs to take place immediately in our lives if we're going to save our lives from the lusts of sin that the Bible tells us are waging war against our very souls. I want you to go into the book of James this morning. We're going to start in James chapter 1 because I want you to understand who this book is written to. Now we're going to continue on in, in 1 John next week. We've been talking about worldliness. We've been talking about the world that's within us, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We've talked about having to deal with that. And today I want to talk about what do you do when that temptation raises its head and confronts you with something that you really desire to do. And we're talking really about besetting sins this morning. We're going to be talking about believers who have given themselves to certain sinful practices in their lives that have become besetting or even addictive. They're the sins that you are really struggling with and don't seem to be having a great deal of success in winning over. They are defeating you more than you are defeating them. Now, I don't know, maybe none of you have those kinds of sins in your life. Maybe none of you have besetting sins or, or sin issues in your life that when they raise their head, you almost automatically put up the white flag and say, I give up, I surrender, let me go do it, and then I'll ask God to forgive me later. And then you feel very guilty and very much ashamed, and you tell God, God, I'm not going to do that ever again. I hate this kind of activity. I hate this sin. And you come back, and for two to three weeks, you're doing real well. And then at the end of two to three weeks, you fall again. Now, I think that probably all of us struggle with sin to some degree. It's interesting, there's a book out, it's called The Mortification of Sin. It's a great book, and it's great for a lot of reasons. One reason is because it was written in 1656 by a Puritan named John Owen. We've got a couple on the back table. But if you want to know about the mortification of sin, Romans 8, 13, what we're supposed to be doing with sin, then I'd encourage you to get this book. It's an excellent, excellent book. It's been, it's been made into uh, easy-to-read language, and so this will really help you in this battle against sin. And the reason why I encourage you to do this is because we should all be battling sin. If you're not battling sin this morning, you're not in the battle. You're just not in the battle. You are, you're either living a life that is in fantasy land, or you're not saved. I'll be very frank with you. If you're not battling sin this morning, those are the only two possibilities. Because none of us have reached a stage of sinless perfectionism and we won't until the day we get to heaven because we're going to be in this flesh until the day our flesh is redeemed and we have new bodies we go to heaven. And so we're all battling the flesh, every single one of us, if we are a believer. Now let me tell you, here's the mark of an unbeliever. An unbeliever does not battle his flesh because he loves his sin. 
Why does he battle something that he loves? He may not like the results of it. He may not like the fact that it causes him consequences that are not pleasurable, but he's not battling his sinful lusts. Only the Christian battles sinful lusts. And so if you're not battling those lusts today, again, you're either living in fantasy land or you're not saved. Because a Christian is going to be known by two things. Number one, the battle that's going on within him as well as the peace that he has within him. Now again, we're going to go to James this morning because in James, James gives us some very powerful instructions for how to deal with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But again, just so you know, who this book is being written to. Let's look at James chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Let's see who it's being written to. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. He's writing this book to Jewish Christians, but they are Christians. There are some scholars today that come to the book of James and they divide it up. And they say, well, this part's written to Christians, this part's written to non-Christians. Be very careful when you do that in the Word of God. You know, when the book is addressed to Christians, then you need to assume this book is for Christians. And just because you come to places in the book where you say, well, man, I just don't think that that's, that's what a Christian would be doing. I just don't think that that can happen because that's not part of my Christian experience. This book is written to Christians, and so we need to understand that when we come to James chapter 4 and we read about Christians who are struggling with lust and besetting sins and who have given themselves over to these sins to such a degree that God says you're, you're acting as though you're my enemies. You're the friends of the world. And we say, well, that, that can't be a Christian. No, it is a Christian. There's plenty of Christians who have given themselves over to certain sins. Now, maybe the majority of their life is a life that is lived for God, but they've got certain areas that are hidden away, tucked away, maybe where no one else sees that they've given themselves over to that sin, and that sin has them enslaved. Now, that's a tragic state to be in, because according to Romans chapter 6, Christ has broken the chains. No Christian should ever be enslaved to a sin habit Because the chains have been broken when Christ died on the cross of Calvary and saved us. He broke the power of sin. He canceled its power. But when we walk back into the chains and those chains are wrapped around our ankles and we won't walk out of them, we won't break loose of them when the locks are broken, we enslave ourselves to certain sin practices. Now, it may be attitudes. We may be dealing today with critical spirits. You know, everywhere you go, you've got a critical spirit. You're complaining about this, complaining about that. Nothing is good enough. No one can measure up. Maybe it's a spirit of jealousy. You're just jealous. You see people and they're up front and you're jealous because you're not up front. You're jealous of what they have. You're jealous of of their status in life. Maybe it's immorality. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe that's the area that's tucked away and nobody knows about. You can't break out of that. Maybe it's anger. You're just an angry person. You know, you just, you're just angry and frustrated at everything. Maybe it's obesity. Maybe it's substance abuse. Maybe it's alcoholism. Maybe it's a lot of different things. But you know what? Christians can end up enslaving themselves to sins that Christ has already broken the chains free from you. But you walk back to that. You walk back and you allow the chains to wrap around your ankle, and so you're stuck in those things. So that's the kind of people that James is writing to here. Let's look at James chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of your quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? Where for pleasures is lust. You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Here's these Christians who are just consumed with pleasure. They're consumed with their lusts. And that's what they're focusing their lives on right now. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit 
which he has made to dwell in us. Now, let's look at verse 5 for just a second. Then we're going to jump into verses 6 through 10. And that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time. In verse 5, we have a little bit of a textual issue. This, this verse 5, where it says, uh, do you, or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? After that, there's a possibility of about three translations there. I mean, the verse can go three different ways. And it's very difficult to figure out what is exactly meant there. Now, what you do need to understand is that whereas most of you have spirit capitalized there, and so it tends to make you think of the Holy Spirit, understand that in Greek, the letters aren't capitalized. Okay, it was all written in small letters. There was no capitalization. All it is is the word pneuma. It could mean Holy Spirit or it could simply mean spirit. It doesn't have to mean Holy Spirit. Probably what it's talking about is the spirit that God created within us that fell at creation. It could mean that God jealously desires the Holy Spirit, which he has made to dwell in us. But that doesn't seem to really make a whole lot of sense with the rest of the passage. The other possibility, the other possible translation is this, is that he jealously desires the spirit that he caused to live in us. In other words, God has a a jealous desire for our spirit. He doesn't want us to be playing with the world and playing with sin. He wants our loyalty for himself. But even that may not be exactly what's meant here. Here's the third possibility It would go like this. The spirit that he caused to live in us lusts intensely. The spirit that he caused to live in us lusts intensely. That's probably what is being referred to because when you look at the rest of the passage, it seems to make more sense. That what James is saying is this, is that the spirit that God put in us in its fallen state has a very serious problem. And the problem is, is that it sins intensely. It has a problem with sin. Now, most of us would agree with that. And so when you look at verse six, here's the contrast. But he gives a greater grace. That's why I think the third possibility is probably the strongest, is that the spirit which God put in us in its fallen state is a spirit that lusts intensely. It's got a problem with sin. And so you would think that with that problem that we have with sin, that we would be hopeless. But it says, but God, he gives a greater grace. Now, what we're going to see this morning is this, is that the only lasting and effective means by which to be successful in the fight against sinful lusts, against temptations, against addictions, is to immediately, decisively, and drastically Humble ourselves before the Lord so as to receive his greater grace, which is designed especially for those who are struggling with persistent and powerful sin issues. Now, again, keep in mind, we're talking here about Christians who've got some real serious sin struggles, some persistent sin struggles. All of the tenses that are used in verses one through four describing these people are in present tense. That means that this stuff that's going on in their lives is continually going on every day. They've got some real sin issues here. That's why some scholars come here and they say chapters 1 through 3 is talking to believers. Chapters 4 from 11 to the end of the book is talking about believers. But when you get to chapter 4, 1 through 10, that can't be talking about believers because there's just too much sin there. Well, you know, that... If that's the case, then a lot of us would go out of here pretty discouraged, wouldn't we, this morning? Because for a lot of us, there's just a little bit of sin here, isn't there? We're still struggling with some sin issues. And so I take chapter 4, verses 1 through 10 to be very comforting. Because he's addressing believers who are struggling with sin. And he says, here's the deal. You've got a sin issue. You've got a sin problem in your heart. Even as a believer, you've got a problem here. Because your heart still desires to sin. You've got a struggle here. Let me tell you how to take care of that. And he starts out by saying this in verse six, but he, God, gives a greater grace, a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, what you need to understand here is that this is a conditional promise in Scripture. When it says that God gives a greater grace, this is based upon a condition. 
This doesn't say that just because you're a Christian and just because you're struggling with sin that God automatically gives you this greater grace to fight your sin. Uh-uh, there's a condition here. And the condition is found in the latter part of verse 6. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Well, what kind of grace? It's the same grace he was talking about just a couple lines before, this greater grace. That's why the first point of the message is this, is in our battle against our sinful lusts, we must seek the conditional promise of God's greater grace through humility. Through humility. Now, before we look at the condition, let's look at the promise of greater grace. The Greek words are mezona charis. Mezona charis. Mezona comes from the Greek word mezon, which finds its root in the Greek word megas. Megas. Megas is where we get our word mega. What's mega mean? If I were to say mega bucks, megaphone, that's talking about more than what you need in a given situation. That's what megas means in Greek. More than what you need in a given situation. More than what you normally need. And so when he's talking about this grace, it's saying that God gives a mega grace or a super grace to those people who are struggling with sin issues when that sin raises its head. And it's more grace than you would normally need in the course of a day. And so what God is promising here to those Christians who are struggling with sin and have been giving themselves into sin, is there is a greater grace available to you. There's a super grace. There's a mega grace for you. And God's willing to give it to you if you will meet the conditions of the promise. Now, what I find very encouraging here is this, is that even in God's economy, God's plan, temptation has a purpose, and it's a good purpose. Do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying, listen, if you're one of those Christians who is struggling with sin, besetting sin, understand you have the opportunity every time those sin lusts raise their head, every time temptation comes into your life, you have an opportunity to experience the power and the grace of God in a way that you normally could not if you were not tempted. In other words, when the temptation comes, God says this is an opportunity for you to experience greater grace. Now, I want you to understand, the King James Version puts more grace. That's not a correct rendering of the word megas. It's not saying that God gives more grace. This word megas is talking about a greater grace, a superior grace, a power that you don't know normally in the day-to-day activities of your life, but if you humble yourselves before the Lord, when temptation raises its head, God will allow you to experience something greater than you need. Greater than your sin, greater than your temptation, greater than all the failures in your life. No matter how many times you fail before, God says, I promise you a greater grace. Mega grace, super grace. What's the condition? Well, look at verse 6. But he gives a greater grace. And here's the condition. Therefore, it says. The scripture says. God is opposed to the proud. God doesn't give this grace to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Now again, grace in the context of what we're talking about is talking about this greater grace. What He's doing is He's quoting Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 out of the Septuagint. The Greek rendering of the Old Testament, which says the exact same thing. And what, Paul, what James is saying is this, is if you want this greater grace that God promises when you are being tempted you're going to have to humble yourself. Now look down at verse 10. He gives the condition again. He, he bookends the condition around some verses that are going to be very important for us to look at. Verse 10, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. Now don't, don't spiritualize the word exalt. I think it's the NIV or King James. One of them says it lifts you up. That's all the word means. Don't don't get this idea, if I humble myself in the presence of the Lord, He's going to move me to the front of the line. He's going to put me at the head of the table. He's going to send me to the, the, the richest place in heaven, all that. No, all it means is to be lifted up. The idea is this, as we're dealing with temptation, is that as you humble yourself before the Lord, God gives you greater grace and He lifts you up above, is what the word means. He lifts you out of reach. What's He talking about? He takes you out of reach of the power of those temptations. He takes you out of reach 
of their ability to be victorious over you. Now, if that's the condition that we humble ourselves, then we need to understand what does God mean when He says we need to humble ourselves. And and God didn't leave this to our imagination because that's what verses 7 through 9 are going to tell us. They're going to tell us how we actually humble ourselves. The primary condition of humility is evidenced or manifested three ways when we're dealing with sin issues that raise their head in our lives. Now, before we look at verses 7 through 9, what you need to understand is that each one of these is a command in the Greek text. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, be miserable, be mournful, weep, let your laughter be turned into mourning, your joy to gloom. Those are all commands. Every single one of them. They're also aorist tense commands. Now, You've often heard, and it's true, that when you have an aorist tense command in Greek, we're talking about action that is once and for all, never to be done again. It's once and for all. Typically, when we're using verbs that are talking about salvation and they're in the aorist tense, that's what they mean. We were saved once and for all. We were redeemed once and for all. Here's what you need to know about the aorist tense. The aorist tense can also be used to talk simply about action that is immediate, decisive, instinctive. You do it immediately, right now. Automatically. No delay. No waiting. That's how the aorist tense is being used here. It's not being used as once and for all and never do it again. It's being used as decisive, immediate action that you do every time sin raises its head. Now, that's how it's being used. So these commands we're going to look at are things that need to be put in place immediately, and decisively, you don't wait. You know what I found in my life? I found in my life this, this simple principle. That when temptation raises its head in the areas of my life where I am prone to sin, prone to weakness, if I allow the temptation much more than four to five seconds up here, I'm dead. Much more than four to five seconds thinking about it, I'm dead. I have been taken captive by the temptation. I have got to deal with it immediately, decisively, instinctively if I'm going to win that battle over temptation. Because if I play with it, I guarantee you I've lost the battle. Don't you find that to be true? You play with it, you lose the battle. Or at least you make the battle much harder than it ever had to be with. That's why we're to take those thoughts captive immediately. Now, Let's look at how humility is defined for us here. Here's the condition of humility defined. Here's how you show the humility and how you receive this greater grace. Now, I want you to understand that the greater grace is not designed to help you do these things. God's grace will help you do these things. The greater grace is given to you after you have shown the condition of humility by doing these things to win that battle. Now, here's how... You do it. Number one, submit, therefore, to God. Here's point number two. In our battle against our sinful lusts, we must drastically humble ourselves so as to receive God's greater grace by immediately and decisively doing the following whenever tempted to sin. When the Bible says that we are to submit, therefore, to God, notice the therefore. It's connecting us back to the receiving of the greater grace. He says, God is opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. If you want this greater grace, here's what you need to do. Here's how you show humility. Submit, therefore, to God. Comprehensively, what this is talking about is comprehensively submitting all of our life to God and His authority. Immediately, decisively, comprehensively, Submitting all of our life to God and His authority. The Greek word for submit is a word which which means to voluntarily place yourself underneath the authority of a superior. And so what James is saying here is that when temptation raises its head, the first thing you need to do immediately, decisively and instinctively, is say, no, I'm not going to do... What you want me to do, I'm going to submit myself to the authority of God. I'm going to submit myself to the authority of God's Word. You know, all of us know what the Bible says about our sin. There's not a single person in here, I doubt, 
or I think, that doesn't know that what they're involved in and what they're doing as far as besetting sin is sin, and you don't know what the Word of God says about that. And so what James is saying is if you're going to show humility rather than pride in dealing with your sin, the first thing you've got to do when temptation raises its head is say, no, I'm not going that way. I'm submitting myself to what the Lord says. The Lord says that pornography is wrong. It's adultery. It's lust. It's terrible. No, I'm not going to think about that. The Lord says lust is wrong. I'm not going to take a second look. I'm going to look away because the Lord says no. The Bible says that jealousy is wrong. So when that jealous thought enters my mind, no. I'm going to submit myself to the Word of God. In other words, there's an instinctive, decisive, immediate decision that takes place in your life when sin raises its head in which you say, no, I'm going to submit myself to the Word of God and to the authority of God. Now, you will not do that if you don't make that decision beforehand. Let me tell you that. You never will. If you, don't, if you have not already committed in your life right now that you're going to submit your life to the Word of God and say no to sin whenever sin raises its head, you're probably not going to do that in the first five seconds that temptation raises its head. I, you know, I don't need to, to necessarily tell you how temptation works. We know how temptation works, doesn't it? It works very quickly. Very, very quickly. And beware of those moments in your life, those one to two to three week periods in your life where that sin temptation seems to have gone away. And you seem to think that, oh man, everything's great. I'm finally having victory over this. Keep in mind, here's what's happening. It's just waiting. It's just waiting. Waiting for you to let your guard down. Waiting for you to become overconfident. Waiting for you to become proud. And it will come back with a force and a fury that you've never known before and it will put you flat on your back faster than you can count to five. You need to immediately and decisively make up your mind that you're going to submit your life to God. Now here's something else that is involved in this era's tense here was submit therefore to God. This is talking about a comprehensive submitting to God. Here's how some of us operate. Some of us have sin issues in our life that are very important to us because we know the consequences of those sin issues are very detrimental to any kind of wholesome living. And we will fight those things tooth and nail all the while letting other sin issues surround us and we do them at no, with no problem at all. You know, maybe, maybe your problem is anger and so you really try to keep a, a, a gauge on that anger. But yet you have no problem gossiping. Or maybe the problem is pornography and you put all your effort in fighting pornography and, and sexual lust and sexual immorality, but you have no problem with your pride. What this is talking about is that there needs to be a comprehensive submitting of your entire life to God if you want this greater grace. In which you say, God, no, I'm not going to go this way. I'm going to submit myself to you and the authority of your word and I'm going to do what you want me to do. That's the choice I'm going to make when this sin raises its head. Second thing. He says, after submit therefore to God, look what he says in verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's another conditional promise. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, understand that not all of our temptation comes from Satan directly. The idea here is he's going to the worst case, Satan tempting you, but included in that is all sources of temptation, whether it's your own fleshly lust, whether it's the world, or whether it's Satan. But obviously, thinking that Satan would be the strongest, he's saying, listen, if you resist Satan, he'll flee from you. You resist the world, the world will flee from you. You resist your temptation, the temptation will flee from you. The word resist is a word which means to stand against, to take a stand against. It was a military term. It was a word which meant to dig in and stand and not quit standing, not leave your post. You stand in that position and you don't give it up. You don't give an inch. You take your stand, you dig in, and you stand firm. Now, interestingly enough, the word for devil here is diabolo. Diabolo. It's the word for Satan which describes him as a slanderer and a liar. 
It's interesting that, that that's the word that's being used to describe him here, because I think what James is hitting on is, is the basic nature of temptation. You see, Satan is a liar who uses sin and temptation to slander God. He lies to you and he lies to me by tempting us to believe that we will be happier if we sin and that we will miss out on some pleasure if we do not sin. And so what James is saying is you've got to resist those lies. Because every time you give in to temptation, it's because you believe that you will be happier pursuing the temptation than you will saying no to the temptation. You give in to the temptation because you believe that if you don't, you're going to miss out on some pleasure that you really want to experience. And so Satan comes in, the world comes in, the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, the pride of life come in, and they tell you, do this and you'll be happy. Do this and you'll feel important. Gossip about this person and it will elevate you. Think critically about this person and you'll think better about yourself. See, it's promising you happiness immediately. And it's promising you if you don't pursue it, you're going to miss out on some kind of happiness. And so what James is saying is, number one, you've got to submit yourself to the authority of God immediately, within seconds of the temptation. And the second thing you've got to do is you've got to start, start resisting those lies. And how do you resist the lies? Scripture. Scripture that's up here. If you are not in the habit of studying the Word of God on a regular basis so that the Word of God is getting into your life, and if you're not in the habit of memorizing Scripture on a regular basis, let me tell you, your battle with temptation is always going to be a floundering battle. Because you don't have a weapon to fight with. Because the only way that you fight the lies of Satan and the lies of your flesh and the lies of the world is with the promises of God. And so if you don't know the promises of God, you're trying to fight without a sword. You don't have the sword of the Spirit to fight with. And so the way that you resist the devil and resist the lies of the devil is by using the promises of God to slay the promises of the evil one. You know, the, the other part of this word to resist has the idea of a persistent resisting. You know, if, if you're under the impression that when you're tempted, you can just say, oh, I'm going to resist the devil. No, I don't want to do it right now. And that's it. And that's as far as your resistance goes. Let me ask you, where do you end up in the next few seconds? In the sin. The idea is a persistent resistance. You've got to resist those promises. You've got to resist those lusts until you slay them, until you mortify them, until you bleed the life out of them. Until you bleed the life out of them. Go with me back to Mark for just a second. I read this just the other day. It's Mark chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. When Jesus was baptized, after he was baptized, he was led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. That was the purpose, to be tempted by Satan. How many times was Jesus tempted? Be careful. Because I know what you're thinking. Three times. Uh uh. No. Look at verse 13. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. We look at, at the, the three big temptations. Oh, he was tempted. He's under 40 days. At the end of the 40 days, then Satan came and, and tempted him with these three big temptations. Jesus only had three temptations to withstand, and he won. My word, that's... Who couldn't... You know, no. He was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. The temptation was persistent. It was continual. It was ongoing. It was an onslaught. The battle in which the powers of hell were trying to get the Son of God to sin. The problem was the Son of God could not sin because that was the proof He is God. 
But he knows what persistent temptation is. He knows what continual temptation is. He was tempted for 40 days in the wilderness. And so the idea that, that you maybe can raise your head against a temptation once and it's going to go away and never bother you again, the devil's going to run away with his tail between his legs, that's not true. You've got to resist it persistently and continually and you've got to fight it for all you're worth. Well, the devil ain't going to run. Not from you. Not from me. There needs to be a continual and a persistent engagement of the promises of God and the Word of God against the lies and the slander of Satan. Now let's look at the next command that shows humility. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Drawing near to God. That phrase, draw near to God, is actually a phrase that's used throughout the Old Testament. Used in the book of Hebrews. And and the idea behind the phrase primarily was of the priests as well as the people of God drawing near to Him for the purpose of worship. Leviticus, Exodus, Ezekiel. It's talking about the people, come, Isaiah, about the people drawing near to their God for the purpose of worship. Now, sometimes it's used in a negative sense in which they drew near not with the proper practices or the proper attitude of worship, but the idea behind drawing near to God was to draw near in worship. And there's two ways that James is telling us that we draw near. One way is in worship. The other way is in repentance. Now we'll look at the worship part first. If you're going to fight sin and win, not only do you need to submit yourself to God immediately, not only do you need to use the promises of God to resist the devil immediately, you need to start worshiping God immediately. Now some of you think, well, does that mean sing songs and start praying prayers? It doesn't have to, but if that works for you, go ahead and do it. But I'll guarantee you this, if you don't start worshiping God immediately, you won't win. Because here's what's going on. Understand what happens in temptation. When you and I are tempted, we are being tempted to love something more than God. We are being tempted to be loyal to something more than we're being loyal to God. We are being tempted to give ourselves in worship to something other than God, regardless of what the sin temptation may be. And so the only way you can fight that is by immediately and decisively drawing near to God and worshiping Him. Now, here's what happens when you and I are doing this. Temptation raises its head. Whatever your area of weakness may be, within the first second of that temptation starting to come into your heart and your mind, you say, no, no. That, that's against the Word of God. That's against the authority of God. No. And then you start using the promises of God. Where God says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And you say, I want to see God. I want to experience God in my life. I want a pure heart. No. And you start using the promises of God to resist Satan. And then the next thing you immediately do is you begin to think, you know what? If I sin against God... I'm going to lose. I'm going to break fellowship with God. I'm going to lose my joy. I'm going to lose my peace. I'm going to lose my happiness that I have in the Lord. And I'm going to to forfeit all that for this sin. Now, what are you doing? You're, You're putting a value on something, aren't you? You're saying that God is more valuable than that sin. What is that? That's worship. The old Anglo Saxon word for worship was worth ship. W-O-R-T-H dash dash ship. Worth ship. The idea behind worship was you put the worth where it belongs, the value where it belongs. And when you value God or see God as more worthy of anything else in life, then you are worshiping Him with all your heart, mind, and soul. So when you're tempted to sin... And Satan's giving you those lies and saying, this will make you happy. This will give you significance. This will make you feel good about yourself. And you start to battle it with the promises of God and you start to say, no, if I go that way, I'm devaluing the promise of God. I'm devaluing God. No, God is more valuable to me than that sin. You're worshiping God. You're drawing near to Him in worship. And God's going to give you that greater grace. Whenever you and I win the battle of temptation, we have worshipped. 
Whenever we lose the battle of temptation, we have worship. Did you know that? You have. The question is, what did you worship? You win the battle of temptation, you worship God. You lose it, you worship the sin. Because you chose the sin as being more valuable than God and all that God could provide you. Now, there's another way that we draw near to God, and that's through repentance. That's through repentance. Before we look at that, let me say this too about worship. You know, when, when I, and I find this true in my life, you know, I, I try not to, you know, I preach book by book, verse by verse. And so the challenge of that is, is that it's very difficult if these things are not true of me and I'm not experienced the truths of these things in my life, it's difficult to preach about them because I'm preaching about something I don't know. And I'm trying to go down into territory that I've never been. And so the challenge for a pastor who preaches through the Word of God expositionally, verse by verse, is that, that he's got to be living with this stuff and apply it in his own life, the battles, the failures, the victories, and able to come to his people and say, Here, here's what the Bible says, and here's how it works, and, and here's, here's what I've found to be true. You know what I find to be true with my temptations, with the struggles that I go through in life, and I, and, 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 and I have intense temptations. Let me, let me be very frank and very honest with you. I have found that as a pastor, the temptations that come into my life are probably stronger than at any other point in my life. I was, as a police, it was easy being a police officer. Easy. And I was confronted with things as a police officer that I'm never confronted with as a past off, past, pastor, but it was easy to say no. As a pastor, the battle can become intense because Satan wants the shepherd to do what? Fall, and then there happens to the sheep. The sheep scatter. Intense temptations sometimes. But here's what I have found in my own battle with sin, in my own struggle with temptation when it raises its head. When I begin to look at Christ, when I begin to, to consider the value of Christ and the worth of Christ, when I begin to, to picture Christ on the cross of Calvary paying for my sin, when I envision Christ returning in all of His glory for me, do you know what that does to the power of temptation in my own heart? It kills it. It kills it. But the battle is this. I can't think of that for just a moment and win. I've got to keep thinking about that. I've got to persist in worshiping God and thinking about Christ and thinking about the value of Christ. And that's when the sin begins to lose its power. And it begins to die and you begin to mortify that. I find in my life this, that you can only look at Christ and sin at the same time in one scenario if you're a believer. It's at the cross. That's the only time you can. You can't look at God and you can't look at sin at the same time. You can't. You can't be pursuing God, and you can't be pursuing sin at the same time. It's an impossibility. There's only one place, only one scenario that you can see God and sin in the same picture. You know where that's at? It's at the cross. For a believer, it's at the cross of Calvary. And so I've got to immediately start thinking about the cross and about the sin that's been paid for and about what I'm going to forfeit if I choose to pursue this sin and I've got to resist and worship God continually until the sin loses its power. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. And let's turn there very quickly before we go to the repentance part. You know, Dan read that for us this morning. It's so powerful. Look at Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He knows the power. He knows the persistence of temptation. Therefore, verse 16, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. Again, the context. In the midst of our temptation. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have to draw near to that throne. You've got to draw near to God if you want that grace and that help in your time of need. 
And for the believer, there is no greater need than when he is fighting or she is fighting temptation. Now let's go back to James chapter 4. Let's finish up with verse 9. We'll talk verse 8 and 9. We draw near through repentance. It says in verse 8, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Again, the phrase draw near is used of worship throughout the word of God. But then he gives these commands. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. It almost sounds like, man, this is so contrary to what the church is saying today, right? I mean, most of the time we go to church, they're no longer worship services. They're called celebration services, okay? Now, I don't know if you want to call it a celebration service, but let me tell you something. that The Christians are told to worship more than they're told to celebrate. And you can't, you can't celebrate unless you're worshiping. And you can't celebrate unless you've repented. To try to celebrate God and celebrate church and celebrate all that's going on in many churches today without ever coming to a point of repentance doesn't work. And understand, again, the kind of people, the kind of believers that James is talking to. He's talking to believers that have given themselves in to certain sin issues, and that's why they've got this problem. If they'd started their Christian life, say at four or five years of age, and, 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 and they had just obeyed the Word of God, yes, they sinned, but they just didn't give themselves in to habitual practices of sin. That didn't happen. They'd be a lot better off than they are right now. But these are guys that gave in. These are guys that pursued some sin issues. And now they're struggling with those sin issues. And so one of the first things that's going to have to happen if they're going to draw near to God so as to receive this greater grace is they're going to have to do what? Repent. You're going to have to repent. You're going to have to start thinking differently about your sin. In other words, instead of thinking that, man, this is really something fun that I'd really like to do and it's going to make me happy, it's going to give me meaning, it's going to make me feel important, What James says, here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to cleanse your hands, you sinners. Hamartaloi. A very strong word used for sinners who have given themselves over to certain practices of sin that have now begun to enslave them. He says you need to cleanse your hands. What's he talking about? It's an heiress command. It means, you know what? You're going to have to start changing your behavior. It's outward repentance. So there's going to have to be some outward repentance here that's going to have to be seen. Now, that can't take place unless there's inner repentance. And so go to the next phrase. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And Kai here is being used in sequence. You're going to do this by doing this. You cleanse your hands, you sinners, by purifying your hearts. No one can change behavior without a changed heart. You can't have changed behavior without a changed heart. So he says, number one, you need to to take a different look at your sin. You need to think differently about this. You need to have some outward repentance. Behavior needs to change. But that's only going to happen as you purify your heart. You're going to have to do this. Again, we're not talking about unbelievers here. Unbeliever can't do this. An unbeliever can't change his, his actions. An unbeliever can't change his heart. Only believers can do this by the indwelling power of the Spirit of God who is in them. An unbeliever can't do this. But you are responsible to do it, and I am responsible to do that. You know, cleansing our hands may be something like this. You're walking down into the grocery store, and there's certain aisles in the grocery store, if you're a man, that you really aren't supposed to be walking by because they cause you to think thoughts you shouldn't think, and they begin this whole progress of lust of the flesh starting to rise up. So how do you cleanse your hands? Don't walk down that aisle in the grocery store. That's pretty simple, isn't it? If you know you're, you've got a route to work and it's going to take you by certain billboards that really just cause the lust of your flesh to start rising up and going into turmoil, change the way you go to work. If there's certain situations that you find yourself in that, that, that cause you to become jealous and angry, that, that cause you to start thinking thoughts you shouldn't think, well, then change the situations. Look over at Hebrews chapter 12 for just a moment. Hebrews 12. The writer of Hebrews, look at verse 12. He's he's talking about fighting sin. And he says that we haven't fought sin to the point where we've shed blood over it. We're We're not bleeding because of our fight of sin. He talks about being disciplined by our Father. And then in verse 12, he says this, Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. In other words, 
in, in a metamorphic way and in, in, a, in a figurative way, listen, if you've got sin issues, you need to strengthen those parts of your life and your heart that are, that are inclined toward that sin. And look at verse 13. And make straight paths for your wheat feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. In other words, if you've got a sprained ankle, don't walk on a rocky road. If you've got an inclination toward a certain sin area in your life, don't go to that place. Don't allow yourself to be tempted in that way. Cleanse your hands. Change your behavior by purifying your heart. There needs to be an internal repentance. Let's go back to James chapter 4. How do you do that? He says this. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. What that means is this. Don't love your sin and God at the same time. Don't try to do that. It doesn't work. Rather, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. What he's talking about is this. You've got to start thinking differently about sin. And instead of celebrating it, instead of finding joy in it, instead of finding happiness and meaning in sin, you've got to hate it. And you've got to change this this frivolity, this flippant attitude towards sin that we all have. And we say, oh, you know what? The devil made me do that one. I'm backsliding this week. (laughs) No, you're sinning, you idiot. You're sinning. That's what you need to say. I'm sinning. I'm sinning against God. This is wrong. And I change my attitude towards sin. And instead of loving it and desiring it, I hate it. And I become miserable over it and I mourn over it and I weep over it. And instead of laughing about it, I cry about it and my joy becomes gloom because I hate it so much and what it does to my life and my relationship with the Lord. Then verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. It's interesting that verse 10 and verse 6 both have the same condition. Verse 6 He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. He will exalt you. And the way you humble yourself is by submitting to God immediately, resisting the devil immediately, drawing near to God in worship and repentance immediately. And God's promises, He will give you greater grace, mega grace, to fight that sin and win. You know, there can be a day, there's not going to be a day till we get to heaven where we experience sinless perfection. That's just not going to happen. Because even if you gain victory over this area, you're going to struggle in another area. You're going to have some sin issues you're dealing with all the rest of your life. But those besetting sins can be laid at your feet conquered. They can be. Because the power that canceled sin conquers sin to the greater grace that God provides to those who humble themselves in this whole battle of fighting sin. Now, if you choose not to humble yourself, you say, you know what, Mark, that was, that's really pretty, that was nice, uh, kind of nice words, but you know what, I've got my own way. I've got a 12-step program I'm involved in, and that's going to fight sin for me. Guess what? No greater grace. You've chosen your own way to fight sin. You've forfeited God's way. You want the greater grace? You've got to do it God's way. You know, when you and I sin, God is not surprised. He's not taken off guard. He's not mad at you. All the wrath was poured out upon Jesus at the cross of Calvary. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He's not disappointed in you. Some of us say, well, God's disappointed in me with my sins. Well, what's that say about God? If God's disappointed in you, then He was surprised that you sinned, and God can't be surprised. He's not disappointed. He's not pleased. He's not thinking up ways to get even with you and He's most certainly is not hating you. Rather, when we sin, God loves us so much that He bids us to come before Him, to come to the throne of grace to receive mega grace in our time of mega need. God says, come before My throne in your time of need and I will give you mega grace. Grace that is more than you normally need to deal with the sin issues in your life. You know, God promises this grace to His children because He wants us to win the battle of temptation. Regardless of how many times we have given in and failed. Regardless. God doesn't give up on His children. He he chastises those believers in James chapter 4, but immediately tells them, but this is how you can succeed. 
and tells them how to deal with sin. It's never too late to ask God for His help to start doing what is right. Never. If you're breathing air, it's never too late to start asking God for His help to do right. There is no pit so deep that God's grace cannot fill it and overflow it. No pit at all. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for Your Word. And I pray, Lord, that as we come through this section in 1 John about the lusts of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, the pride of life, I, I trust that, that this is brought to a heightened awareness just the sin issues that we deal with on a regular day-by-day basis. And Father, as we go to James this morning, and we see Your method of fighting sin, that of humbling ourselves before You by submitting to You, resisting sin, drawing near to You in worship and drawing near to You in repentance. I pray, Father, that these would be the things that we would would use, the tools that we'd use, and we'd practice with them. We'd get out there and we'd start using these things. And that we'd persist until temptation lays dead at our feet. I pray that You'd cause us to be a church of overcomers who overcome the world using the tools and the methods You've given us. In Jesus' name. Amen.